Well, we lost a few people, and we're about to lose two more. Jim and Joan have to take off, but it's been great having you both here. Really wonderful. But we have gained Gary from San Francisco. And Gary told me he has a question and might speak for an hour, but keep it brief. From your book. Yes. Uh, it sharpened a really important point for me, which was some ambivalence I had, quest some, some hanging on to the notion that consciousness may be universal as opposed to just associated with my organism, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And it really made me special to think that I was tuned into universal consciousness. That made me different, better. It gave me something that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And I really ha hung on to it, and I like to argue. I would like to, I'd like to uh, sort of get into arguments with people that were strict materialists or, you know, um, neuroscientists about that. And I was slowly losing my ability to justify any belief in universal consciousness. I mean, just there was no foundation for it. It's just that all the gurus have always been talking about it, right? Yes. So that's something I've been hanging on to, and it's loosened up quite a bit. And, and it's created a lot of discomfort in me to not have that to hang on to. It might not be true. I may not have universal consciousness. May not be universal. There may not be consciousness after death. This may be it for me, yeah. and that's you know it's pretty uncomfortable, but it's it's a real sharp point. So well, were were you feeling that way before you came upon my work? Uh, it, it was just it was an area. Well, that was I debating with myself over it? Yes. No, I wasn't. I was still kind of stuck on the idea that... So which book of mine have you read? The, uh, the 10,000 10, Things? I read the 10,000. I'm kind of halfway through the second one. Okay, so if I understand what you're saying, it was coming upon these two books that opened your mind to not knowing. It, it, it lined up. It lined up with where I was going with it. Yeah. And it made, it, made me face it well, a little that's, bit more. That's really directly. beautiful. Happy to hear that. Yeah. I, so. I think John Troy, my co-conspirator here, is, um, likes to say that this is just common sense. I mean, what we have that we know we have is human consciousness. We are like, at least like super intelligent gorillas and apes. We, we know that much. I mean, evolution is obvious, and um, here we are. So why isn't that good enough? I mean, it's beautiful to be human. It can be. It can be the greatest thing in the world, you know? Yeah, I mean, Adi Da would say that you're not truly human until you're awake and truly conscious and, and that you've, you've dropped all this presumption that you're not anything but consciousness. That's to really be human. Uh, but I associate that with sort of a, a universal consciousness, a thread that we're all sort of uh, p pieces of. And I just don't know if that's true anymore. And I, I'm, I don't either. Yeah, and I'm not going to hang on to it anymore. No. What I am able to observe is that we human beings can get into a shared space because we're all conscious. So we have. I have the human mind and so do you. And because we do, we share a great deal of background because that just comes with the language and growing up in the world and all of that. So we can communicate rather deeply, but that doesn't mean that we are on the same consciousness wavelength and that you could know everything I know or vice versa. I don't see it that way. Yeah, it's, it's complicated by claims of clairvoyance and things like that that you uh -huh. know well ancient. when those claims are tested um, no real evidence has ever been found for any of that stuff the people who think that there is some evidence are not sufficiently critical and don't understand the scientific method um, 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 Stories, we all have them, but those, a story proves nothing. It's one person's experience. If there's really clairvoyance and it's so universal, it should be very easy to get some people who have that ability and um, test them. Yeah. 
Yeah. And when those tests have been run, what happens is the clairvoyant claimants end up saying that the test wasn't any good. And the conditions got in their way, and there's too many doubting people in the room, or whatever it is, and this requires a level of faith. Um, in the, I got at this in the 10,000 Things with a chapter on um, astrology, which you have read. Yeah, and that wasn't new to me. I so, knew that stuff. some people hate this idea, but it's a scientific fact, and it has been demonstrated. Astrology is no more accurate in making predictions than throwing dice or flipping a coin. That's exactly how well it works, just like a random guess. And even when that evidence is shown to people, they won't believe it. So my question to you is, what is there about my writing, I really want to know, that moved you when you had had this, all this other reading and believing in that? What, what ended that? What was it that I said that ended that? Um, <clears throat> well, your, your boldness of stating it is one thing, uh, because nobody wants to say it. And, um, and that was sort of where, you know, kind of where I was moving to. So it was sort of the right time to read that. Uh, so kind of giving me permission to try it out. Uh-huh. You follow? As a point of view. Oh, I like, to, I like hearing this. Yeah, and to challenge my presumptions that there was a lot of uh, attachment to, uh, egoic attachment, you know. I believe this, and that gives me some substance, uh, that kind of egoity. And... Um, it's just another thing to uh, disassemble that, um, that, you know, it's, it's not, yeah. Yeah, it's not true. I don't know if it's true or not. It's just I don't, it's unfalsifiable. I don't, I don't, and I don't it's either. If it's not right. falsifiable, I have no interest right. in the question. Because right. if, it, if it's not falsifiable, then it's just belief. Right. So the next, so what came up of all of that for me was, I've stopped arguing. You mean um, with others? Yeah. I, I now just, here's what I know. Here's my, you know, realization, if you want to call it that. And it doesn't matter if you agree. I don't have to explain or, ex you know, I don't have to prove it. And you're free to criticize and bounce off of it. But I really have no interest in converting you or showing you I'm right. That's pretty, no much where I, that's pretty much where I'm at with it too, Gary. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that much. I know a few things, and I have a point of view willing to express it. But if somebody won't um, salute, fine by me. I don't care. Right. So I find there's a lot of people telling you how it is. Yeah. Well, it's like this. And it's like, I mean, it, come on. It's not like that any more than we're a universal consciousness is the way it is. It's unfalsifiable. You know, that's what people come at me with and I... Yeah, well, there are, there are ultimate questions that cannot be answered by human beings. This is what I say. We have primate intelligence and primate intelligence evolved to survive on the African steppes, not to know the secrets of the universe. That's a presumption. It's an outrageous presumption, really, for an evolved gorilla to imagine that it can figure out what's going on on this planet. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing presumption. Yeah. I've given it up for Lent. Yeah. And what's really interesting is we, we also find that our, we're not very, you know, our intuition about reality is really wrong in many ways. It's not even capable of understanding things like quantum mechanics. Well, the, okay, so that's another very good point. Our intuition and our perceptions evolved in the same way, I'm saying, to serve sur animal survival in, under certain conditions. And people like to trust their intuition, but intuition actually evolved to serve certain purposes 
but not to see the big picture. Intuition is about survival and reproduction, not seeing the big picture. And that's what I mean. This is what I call the face of human limitation, seeing the face of human limitation. When you first see that, I say, it comes as a tremendous relief. You see human limitation, and it lets you off the hook. Yeah, like one's own realization of their ignorance, the unbelievable depth of their ignorance, the, the total ignorance really is really what it comes down to. It's like, well, I can give it up then. I don't have to hold on to any feeling of knowing anything. Right, right. And that, that's very freeing. That's how, that's... Gives you a lot more attention and energy for other things, really. Exactly. That's, that's how I feel. When I say I feel free, that's what I mean. I don't have to hold on to anything. All of this can just flow through me. I don't have to decide what it is, what it isn't, where it's coming from, where it's headed. It's, yeah. it's not really, it's above my pay grade. Yeah, it's nice. It's, it's giving me goosebumps thinking about it right now. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great contribution. Yeah, thanks. You're going to be in the movie. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Wish I'd worn a better shirt. <laughs> Oh, I like that. Mm. Would you like to comment, John? I, I, I go back to common sense. It, it seems like when common sense is spoken, it makes sense. Just little, little things point out. A lot of common sense is shared with wit. And the comedian George Carlin, is that his name? The, the comedian who would just say common sense things and just crack people up. To me, I, 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 when I read the 10,000 things, Robert's contribution of common sense in a, uh, a sea of superstitions and myths and lineages and all this stuff, that common sense and there outshines all of the, the the fantasies and ideologies and needing to know uh, simple, the simple, simple things. Uh, it's common sense that. Astrology is kind of made up stuff. Or crystals aren't going to do a lot. <laughs> if, if you're having a heart attack, the crystal's not going to do it for you. Uh, it's common sense that we're just ordinary human beings. That's common sense. We just, we're all in the same herd. And there's a lot of superstition and mythologies and theologies and cosmologies. And it's learn ignorance and get fixed up in there and it doesn't have anything to do with common sense. And, and uh, the disruption of that scaffolding that how we take all of this I'm a Sagittarius and you're a Leo mm -hmm. or <laughs> they got these Reiki healing things and 
they, they, they do research on it, there's nothing there. They do research after research on the Reiki stuff. <laughs> and it's a multi-level marketing scheme. For it, you pay ten thousand dollars, you get to be a Reiki master. Then you can go sell it to somebody else. It's, and it's to me, it's common sense that that's a multi-level marketing scheme. You mentioned Adida. Uh, I found Adida when he wrote <coughs> the Near Listening, and I thought it was good, especially the epilogue. Mm -hmm. I thought that was, but he he put a lot of juice over on the Muktananda and Ramana Maharshi and all of that and kind of was a part of the Ram Dass and all the rest of them kind of building this this link into this Hinduism uh, and all the. I mean, he was wearing some back suit. He wasn't Franklin anymore. <laughs> he put on another suit and another suit. And then when that petered out, he'd come up with a whole other kind of cosmology and a name and all of that. And changed his name every time, right? Changed change his rebrand. They call it rebranding. Rebranding. Yeah. rebranding. Re that, mm -hmm. that brand's going down the tube. Maybe I better rebrand. Uh -huh. So from Bubba Free John to Da, <laughs> these are rebranding. Re and he's really just Franklin. Frank Jones. An ordinary guy. And I, I, I knew his biographer, Samuel Bonder, is a friend of mine. Samuel came to visit me one time, and he spilled the guts out to me mm -hmm. on the whole thing. It was unbelievable. I, whoa. There was a, a tiger that lived in a cage next door. We live out in the country. A, a tiger named Daisy. I told him about this Bengal tiger who was in this cage. It was you could go there and see the tiger. He went over to see the to see the tiger. And he came back, and we've been talking about this kind of stuff. He confessed all the stuff that he really knew. He said, "You know that that tiger? I found my courage. I'm walking away." Mm-hmm. Yeah, he has quite a story, Samuel Bonder. Yeah. So he's doing his own thing now. It's a little kind of similar thing, kind of thing, but he's doing his own thing. But but he he was walk. He had his own back suit on, trying to walk, be like Adi Da wanted him to be, and all that stuff. Yeah, he. His intention is to um, break the mold that Adi Da has set up that is so, goes back. But he finds that he, in his own words, that he's so templated after 20 years of, of exposure that it, it was harder than he thought. He still believed there was such a thing as a Satguru. And what's his, what is he, what's his relationship to that? It's been a struggle for him, I think. He knows better. Yes. <laughs> he knows better. He, he saw. He, he got backstage. So I tell you, a few minutes backstage is pretty self evident. We're just humans, normal human beings. But he had a good branding program going, he just rebranded too much. <laughs> Bubba Free John might have been better for him. Yeah, that was a time where you could have an enormous group of devotees, I mean, around the world. I think in the early 70s, it was fresh, it was new. And nobody really knew just what the dysfunctions were in the West, so. Those guys did well. 
my friend Ganesh and Ramana Maharshi's nephew was running the ashram. His, fa his father didn't want to do it, his father apart. So he took over and ran that ashram for a while. He was there when Adi Da came over there and did the film, and he was telling me how they were staged and everything, and where it looked like he'd been in the cave a long time. He put the dust on him and the theatrics of it all and everything. It was real funny. He's describing all that pretentiousness. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to, another one trying to use the touchstone of Ramana Maharshi like a lineage or something to really put it out there. So he, along with Ram Das and all those back, they, they all started this And in, in, the, in, the, in the beginning, he was a little bit toto -to about it. But then he lost that. When, when he started drinking the Kool-Aid. But uh, one time he said, the only mantra allowed around here is laughter. That was a good one. I like that. But then it got seven steps to heaven. And I, I'm the highest person to ever take a birth. I'm the avatar of avatar. Right. And he really, really, really got drunk into that. Some of those exploits and his sexual pleasures were pretty abusive. There were guys would show up and the wife would be violated and the things were, were pretty, pretty ugly from what I hear from Samuel of that. Yeah, they withdrew the book Garbage and the Goddess because it just exposed too many, um, too much stuff. I believe Samuel was one of the editors of that book. Yes, he was. Yeah. But what I saw, he, he brought up Narcissus as a part of his teaching. That he was a living example of narcissism. Over I mean, he was, in his critique of people being like Narcissus, he was, he was that himself. Exactly. He, physician, heal thyself. I never met him personally. I never met him. I sat with him once. I was a very immature seeker at the time. Yeah. yeah. He would hypnotize people. Pass the mic. Hi, Maggie. Hi. I think I understand what this means, but I'd, but I'd like to hear your, um, uh, uh, you know, what more you want to say. Um, page 136, uh, you're talking about, um, about, it's about talking about uh, killing the Buddha. You know, if you don't, blah, blah, blah. About killing the Buddha. You have a, there's a paragraph on that. And one of the, um, the last sentence in the paragraph says, it is, the ground of your own being that is to be seen. And I just, I think I understand, but I'd like to hear from you. What, what do you mean by the ground of your being? Okay. What goes into that, please? I, if I tried to describe the ground of my being and you heard that and imagined that was the ground of your being, then you would not be killing the Buddha. That's I'm what that means. I'm just trying to understand what ground of being, not your ground of being, but what does that mean in general? What, what would go into that? When, when you're asleep at night, 
you're not really aware of yourself, right? But when you open your eyes in the morning, you are aware of yourself. The world is there and you're there in it, so to speak. Or it's in you is another way of looking at it. But in either case, all this is here, right? How do you deal with that? That's the ground of your being. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, rock bottom. How I deal with it, I don't care if I do have a headache. I've got to get up and get into the world. That's the ground of my being. The ground of my being I've been expressing for the last seven days is this is it. There is no improved future. This is it. just have to be aware and deal with these moments one after another. Allow them to flow. Don't become attached. That's the ground of my being. But that doesn't mean that can be the ground of your... Yes, okay. We all have to have the ground of our own being because the ground has to sustain you. That's why it's called the ground of being. It's where you, it's rock bottom. That's another word for it. What's your rock bottom? See, my rock bottom is I know perfectly well that everything I care about is passing away and will be lost forever, including everything I've ever thought, felt, imagined, wrote, photographed, all that is just water over the dam, including my people I love, my friends, and eventually myself. That's the ground of my being. So since I know all that, I'm very attracted to being awake. As I was saying, when you're asleep, you don't know anything is going on, but when you wake in the morning. So this is kind of like that, but it's just on a different, slightly different plane. But I really don't want to sleep through this life. It's short enough. And I have found that even though there are some bitter pills to swallow along the way, if you're willing to swallow them, you get an awful lot of beautiful moments out of it. An awful lot. I get them every day. And the last chapter in the Depending on No Thing book is the myth of Sisyphus, where Sisyphus has to push a rock up the hill and he can never attain that relief or perfection of completing the task. Just before he gets it there, it rolls back down and he has to then walk back down after it. And one of the points I was making in that analogy is that's really a lot what it is for me. I understand that there's nothing we can attain, and yet I have to keep living and keep pushing. And that can be really difficult at times. One is in pain or disappointed, or some project has gone wrong, or you lose your job, whatever it is, it can be really difficult. You have not gotten a boulder to the top of the hill, and now it's rolled down again. The thing is that I've tried to point out in those moments when you're walking down after it, that can be pretty nice. You're not having the heavy boulder to push, and until you get to the bottom, all you, all you have to do is enjoy the walk. So, if you're willing to push, even though it's senseless, possibly, meaningless, and has no positive outcome, if you're just willing to do that, then maybe the other part of the trip when you're walking downhill is kind of fun. No more boulder to push, at least for now, and um, it's all groovy. So that's, that's the ground of, of Robert's being. He knows, it's going to, he knows he is going to die, and he knows that in every moment, and couldn't forget it if he tried. Doesn't need any reminding. It's self-reminding doesn't need any practice. The, know, the knowing is the practice. 
the knowing that this is this situation here is entirely impermanent every bit of it there's not the least little bit that you can claw back and grasp and say i won this game it doesn't work that way i say i say it doesn't work that way someone may disagree I'll be in heaven with Jesus. I know a lot of people do believe that. And if they do, then that's the ground of their being. Right? That's the story. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about Jung and like the process of individuation that Jungians talk about and how that relates to uh, your understanding of awakening? Great question. Um, the process of individuation, I just want to explain for those who don't know about Carl Jung. He imagined that living was a question of becoming more and more yourself. And he called that individuation when you move out of the group mind and into the individual mind. Yes? Is that, is that yeah. a fair statement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think awakening and indiv individuation or the flowering of old age, all that's the same thing. It might happen to you when you're younger if you're very lucky. I think I was lucky in that way. But sooner or later, in a natural way, this is going to happen. And some people only get it on the deathbed. And then there are the real wretched ones who don't even get it on the deathbed. And they're terrified when they die. That's very harsh. But most people toward the end kind of sink into the understanding, yes, this is impermanent. I gave it a run. Here's my disappointments over here. Here's the things that made it sweet for me. And pretty much accept that everything has to end and I'm tired anyway. I've heard a lot from dying people and this isn't so bad. Well, when you're not dying, I mean, we're all dying all the time, but when you're not in, in having to face up to this immediate end and you're just like sitting here, I will never repeat this moment. Never. This isn't just something where different people could now take these positions and it would all be the same. No, it wouldn't. It's only because you're here that we're talking about Carl Jung. I know about him, but I wouldn't have brought it up. Yes? So Jung I both like and dislike. I like him because I think individuation is a great idea and he had other good ideas. But I dislike him because he had a deeply religious streak and he distorted certain questions. I quoted one in Depending on No Thing where he said he could believe in God because why not? And that hadn't really been the question. He twisted the question so that he could give it a glib answer. I lose respect for that kind of reasoning. Not when an ordinary person has that reasoning because he hasn't been trained to reason. But my God, this is like one of the most educated people on the planet at that time. And I've read his 21 volume collected works. I, I, I went to school at a Jungian Academy for a while, so I do know the subject. And he was very iffy. Plenty of magical thinking mixed in with the good ideas, plus anti-Semitic, which never strikes me very nicely. And far too much love for Catholicism, Christianity. Not Catholicism, but Christianity. Didn't, I don't like it. So I, it's hard for me to recommend Jung anymore, although I once did, you know. Mm -hmm. the, so in, let me just reiterate the individuation and awakening. What I feel is happening in me at this moment is a flower has opened and uh, the pollen is being scattered by the winds and soon the flower will just once the pollen is all scattered, then we know what happens to a flower. It just dries out. And, mm -hmm. 
maybe someone will put me in her hope chest or something, dried out Robert, you know. <laughs> but so this is that moment in my life. And that's why I'm taking all this quite, um, not seriously, but earnestly. Um, this is, I, th I feel this is all very important. Maybe for you, but for me it certainly is, because this is an unrepeatable moment, and it's not here forever. It's going to pass very quickly. Very. So that is awake, and that is individuation, and that is an ordinary flowering of a human life that does not have to be striven for because life is its own renunciation. If we just go with it, we're going to get wake-up calls. And so, see, I use the word awake, but that can be confusing because a lot of people use the word awake to mean enlightened, and enlightened in that classical sense of you, you're one with God and you're a, a cut above everyone else because you're enlightened and the masses will never be enlightened. And I don't see it that way. I meet a lot of ordinary people whom I do consider are awake. And they, they wouldn't know anything about this conversation. Never heard of Carl Jung, doesn't know about any Krishnamurti, it's not, never heard of it. And, but I see what they're doing, and it looks great. <laughs> okay, so that, that's, that's my take on it, on individuation. What you're looking at is a highly individuated human, but also just uh, human. Mm -hmm. Gee, that's, that could be good. <laughs>